So now we come to the subject that everybody's no doubt anxious to hear. And before we get into it deeply, I'm going to share my screen. So this is a, 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 a lathe. It actually belonged to my my um, grand my uh, wife's grandfather, who was uh, when my when my her husband her father was born his her her um, grandfather was sixty one or sixty two. So this goes back to the turn of the last century type of lathe, and I just bought this just to show show guys you know first of all if anybody wants an antique wooden lathe, there you go. But you know <laughs> if, if you. This is what I call a beginner's lathe nowadays. <laughs> so anyway, you know, we're, we're talking about lathes and when it really comes down to um, what lathe we buy, I think what we're talking about is rather than talking about the lathe itself, we're talking about the embellishments of lathes. So I'm just gonna see if I can stop my share here. Um, in the discussion this morning for, um, on lays, I'm, I'm um, particularly interested, and I know there's lots of people have their hand up, so if you, um, we'll try and limit people as if there's a whatever without necessarily trying to cut people off. But I'd be, one of the things I'm very interested in hearing about from people is not just what they would recommend, but I think Ernie mentioned it last week at, towards the end of our discussion that, um, we have things about the lathe we bought that we don't like and would change. And for example, one of the things I don't like about my, um, my um, Powermatic lathe is that it's a uh, 3250 IC, I think, or whatever it is. But my problem is, is that the, it's a really highly, really strong lathe, so I can put a big piece of wood on there. But the e-stop is on the other side from where I normally stand for turning. So if I want, if I started getting into a vibration system or a break or something like that, I have to go around a dangerous piece of wood to get to where the e-stop is. And unlike the one-way lathe or something like that, where you can actually turn the, the, the controls to the other side. So that's one of the drawbacks of that lathe. So anyway, I'm just opening the floor to discussion. Um, what lathe would you guys either uh, recommend or like to have or what about your own lathe um, do you um, would you like to change and I'm going to uh, sort of try and flag through if people wave their hand or something like that you can or just speak up Barry Price go for it uh, I just placed an order in fact for a, a new lathe uh, my current lathe the one that I'm getting rid of is a uh, a jet uh, 1442, I think is how it's sold. It has variable speed, but the variable speed is provided by uh, shiv pulleys. And uh, the lowest speed end on it is around 440 RPM, which is just too fast for doing certain, uh, maybe not turning, but certain procedural things on the lathe. And so I wanted to get a much lower RPM. Barry, you, you also have to have the lathe running to change speed, right? Yes, we do. Or, or at least drawback you, also. You have to be hand turning it. Uh, I mean, you either running or hand turning. Yeah. It's kind of kind of putting a tra manual transmission in gear. You have to have a clutch feature or something. Something has to facilitate it. But anyhow, at the uh, and that presents a, uh, if you last used it at uh, spindle turning, you know, at uh, 1800 or 2000 RPM or something, and you forget to turn it down before you turn it on, uh, you get your hands full all of a sudden with high RPM and shattered bolt. And so uh, electronic variable speed and a, a low RPM capability got me down the road of uh, basically three candidates. Uh, I also did not want to spend $7,000 uh, on a, like a, a large one way or something, but I, the, uh, the Scout uh, was, the, the robust Scout was the highest priced item I considered. And uh, I like most of its features. Uh, I didn't care for, <coughs> The fact that the bed is non-magnetic, 
uh, the, the bedways, I think, are stainless steel, and therefore some fixturing jigs, I rely on these uh, magnet switch things, and you couldn't use them on that. Uh, but it had a lot going for it. What it didn't have going for it was uh, about $4,400 to, uh, to get it the, the way you'd want it. Uh, so it, that came down to a Laguna 1836, which is an 18 inch swing, 36 inch bed, um, and a jet 1840. Um, because the jet was on sale for 10% off as, power, as Powermatic and jet tools quite often are, and Woodcraft was offering free shipping, it, it put the jet at uh, about 2350 full up delivered. Uh, now what it has going for it, I made, made up a little list here, along with the price, the variable speed is, uh, it's on a two pulley system. The low speed is 40 to 1200, which covers pretty much any kind of bowl consideration. And then the high speed is um, 100 to 3200. And it is electronically, it's not a, it's not a, it's like a, a downside is that instead of a, uh, a button bump or something like that, it has a rotating rheostat kind of switch. And so I can see where it would be easy to bump uh, and change the speed inadvertently. So I may have to make some kind of shield for that. Uh, it has reverse. It's got two horsepower. It's a, it's a three phase motor that they do an electronic uh, inverter switch with. And so you, can, you wire it to 220, but single phase. A positive thing in my consideration is its weight, 414 pounds, so it's pretty substantial on the floor. It has a, a very nice indexing system, 36 position indexing system. And uh, something Doug was just mentioning, it has a uh, positionable power off switch. It's on about a, a six foot umbilical cord and you can, it's magnetic. Uh, and you can put it on the bed, on the lathe, on, on the legs, anywhere you want, wherever it's a magnetic surface. Uh, typically, I would guess right about where your knee might be so you can bump it in a hurry. Uh, it's got a five year warranty, whereas most lathes only have a one or two year. The uh, 1836, first of all, was 2750 versus, uh, so it's $400 more. Uh, Amazon does do free shipping on it. The warranty is two years. It's a one and a half horsepower motor uh, without a positionable switch. Otherwise, the two products look very similar. So I'll be getting, they won't be able to ship it until the first week in May. So I can't give you a report on how happy I am with it. Uh, Barry, I'd like to make a couple of comments on that. Some things you said. One of the things, Doug, you're talking about the switch on the 3520B model, which is, I think, what you have. It's what I have yeah. also. You have the fixed position switch, but on the C model, the new one they just come out with, they do have a cable control on that. And I've thought about it. I'm not sure how complicated it is to make up a switch of your own, but I've thought about that. <clears throat> One of the things that you mentioned, Barry, is a weight. I would guess if you're going to do heavy, heavy turning, you're probably going to want to weigh that a little bit. Because my Powermatic weighs about 650. And I had it walking across the painted floor. So I mounted it on rubber pads, and that's <clears> quite a bit. <clears throat> uh, oh. The other thing you mentioned was the speed control, the little reset knob. I use that all the time to start and stop my lathe. And I've never had any trouble with, with it moving or bumping into it while I'm running. So I think that's pretty secure. Anyway, I think comments that, that, that I made a note of what you were talking there. I think one of the things you mentioned uh, about uh, the weight of lathes, and, and people ask me something about speed. 
when I'm turning. And I say, when both you and the lather aren't shaking, you're running the right speed. So, but yeah, you know, almost any lathe, if you get it off center, and the, the biggest problem with the big lathes is that there is a tendency to think that because it's a big lay that won't shake. So you'd start it up and, and lo and behold, you're out of, you're out of whack all of a sudden. Yeah. Oh yeah. So anybody else got a lay that they would really, if they were going to sell it or whatever, have had good experience with it. So I have the 3520 C, the new uh, Powermatic. And I think you guys are talking around the features that they really have changed on this model. Um, the 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 power the emergency switch is really nice the way you can move it everywhere and I think I showed when I showed the hollowing that I absolutely put it at the other end of the lathe um, but they also fixed the spindle lock issue that was really difficult I think on the prior versions uh, that way the lathe the 3520C weighs in at about 700 pounds and I too have the same problem with it walking on a painted floor I actually going to take Ron's suggestion. I've heard others say it too, to put some rubber under the feet, which is probably the way to fix that. And I actually have an epoxy floor, which I think makes it even worse. I have some half inch thick uh, mine conveyor belt and I cut some squares off of that and put it under my pads, level it up. And that's another key thing. You got to level the lathe. Yeah. I heard somebody talking about that and they said that the points didn't line up from the tail stock to the head stock. And they said, well, this is a heavy cast iron lathe. It can't twist. It does twist. you got to level it and set those yeah. points perfect. And, and yeah, it, it will twist. But uh, these mine belts, it stops it. It just sits there now. It never moves. Yeah, mine so, is, my floor is level. But it's interesting because with that epoxy smooth floor, I can push it on the floor um, fairly easily, actually. It amazes me that I can push it on the floor. Oh yeah, I slid mine across the garage floor to position it when I bought it. <laughs> Six hundred and fifty pounds. So, so if we have somebody that comes up to us and says they want to buy a lathe, but they don't want to spend over a thousand dollars, is there anything in the new market that's even worth looking at, as far as you guys are concerned? If you're looking at a smaller swing, maybe a twelve inch or fourteen inch swing, and a shorter bed. But yeah, there's some. I think some good lathes in that price range. They can buy my jet. Well, that's a you. There you go. I, I might add that um, the emergency stop feature and the fact that with a lot of lathes now you can position the control button anywhere on the machine with a magnetic base, and uh, that's an option on a lot of lathes today. It's nice. And but if you look to OSHA regulations for machine installation, it generally states for most machines that you have to have a interrupt in the power supply within 30 inches of the machine. And so having an, uh, the ability to pull the plug out of the wall if all else fails is a pretty important thing. And you might want to think about where you locate your plug. Uh, that reminds me of another comment about that. And these, these uh, electronic variable speed, uh, you, if you plug them into a wall outlet, your electronic drive is going to be running all the time. Now, some of the lathe manufacturers I've noticed now have realized that and put a switch on the lathe to turn the power off on the electronic drive. But my B model, I know, uh, did not have that. And a lot of guys plug them in and then they're on for six months. The drive's running all the time. They get, like any computer, they get screwed up. They don't run. Uh, so I wired mine into a a, an outlet that was switched. I had a wall switch on the wall that I could turn that off and the drive then shuts off. Well, yeah. again, again, you can al always mount your lathe on a standard old square D box with a lever on the side that turns the power off and on. So that can also be your power interrupt. Yeah. And these VFDs, that's variable frequency control. They're taking single phase and changing it into uh, three phase power of any cycle rate between about two cycles and they can actually go faster than 60 and that controls the speed of a yeah. uh, induction motor but it, it, at any rate they uh, uh, lightning likes to find these things like it just gobbles them up it, it just loves these things so disconnecting them regardless from the power supply is a really good preventive uh, disaster. Yeah, definitely.
Ray, do you still have your stubby? Yes. Uh, let me let me just piggyback something that was said, and I, I'll make a comment about the stubby. Um, if you, I, I want to throw a question out, and if you can't answer it before you run your lathe next time, uh, get the answer. Uh, a lot of a lot of people think that when they hit a stop button, and they, they there's a stop button and there's an emergency button. If you're killing power to a variable frequency drive to stop your lathe, what you've done is put it in a runaway mode. So if you have a if you have something on there that's heavy and you kill the VFD, that thing is spinning. You've just taken away the the, the lathe stopping that chuck. So keep that in mind is that stopping it and putting a lathe in a stop mode in an emergency is like you hit a stop button and the lathe, uh, that frequency drive is programmed to go into a stop mode. But if you take power, you're gonna be surprised because if you got a problem. So there's a, there's a kind of a, a, a difference of, you know, the aspect of taking, pulling a plug out of the wall and killing power and hitting a, an emergency stop button. So, uh, uh, you're right on that, way. There's a, then we have what they, what they call a soft start. Well, they start up on a soft rain in the same way on a dynamic braking whenever they shut down. Correct. And so sometimes if you have an emergency, I mean, emergency stops is all the emergency is doing is putting a lathe in a, in a shutdown mode. It, it, it's an emergency okay. stop button, but emergency, when you kill the power, it's not the same thing. So if you go rewiring something, make sure what you're rewiring is going to do what you want it to do, or you get in trouble. Uh, Doug, on the stubby, there's, a, there's one feature about a stubby that I really like is that I can bring the speed of that right down to zero. Yeah. And, you know, you get used to doing that when you're finishing. I can sand on that like I'm holding it in my hand. I mean, I can go like five RPM or I can put finish on, uh, you know, it's one of those simple things that you get used to it. And uh, I had somebody ask me one time, they, they said, well, how do you do that on a lathe? I said, well, I just turn the, turn the knob down. And they, I didn't, I forgot that, that some of them, like with, uh, uh, you know, different drives don't do that. Yeah, mine goes down to 50. Yeah. Well, one of the things you guys are sort of thinking about that I never sort of thought with Barry and his jet and saying that the minimum speed was 440 um, RPM. I never start a hard, uh, a, a slightly wonky piece of wood. I, I, I always start at zero and then turn the speed up slowly. And oftentimes I may be cutting edges or whatever on a, a larger piece at 100 or 150 RPM on a bigger piece. But so to me, that minimum speed is, uh, suggests that you really want to be careful with your wood. If you're at 450, I wouldn't be starting anything with cracks or something in it because it'll, it's a, it can blow up on you. So it's a strong consideration. Um, if you're getting into the artistic stuff, you know, and this is a, a for me, it's a, a comment to some people say is that if it's got a crack in it, throw it away. Some of us choose a little bit of a different approach, but anyway, so. Have we got any other people that have got, uh, uh, I see Randy, Randy Smith there. What's your size of lathe, Randy? Uh, I have a uh, uh, Nova XP, which actually I have a question for the group. Uh, does anybody know of, other than the cast iron legs that Nova sells, I'm looking for some cast, uh, some legs that are adjustable. Made out of cast iron. Yeah, the, the ones that are made by Nova are way too high for me. I'd have to stand on a platform. And uh, I'm looking for something that's adjustable that I can adjust a little lower. Hey, Randy, didn't Nova have some just regular metal legs for that? Yeah, but I looked at those, but they don't seem real sturdy. Actually, that steel stand they made is very sturdy. Um, I, I have one from my, when I ran Nova's in the shop uh, that I use to put bending forms on and it's quite sturdy. I have a 1624 Nova as well and uh, it has those legs and yeah, it's quite sturdy. So can, can you, are, are they adjustable? Can you 
lower the lathe a bit? Uh, no, they're really not adjustable. I suppose you could cut them, but they're they're not adjustable. I'm going to run into my shed and look at them. So, uh, Randy, can you give yourself a, a sitting pad or a standing pad to make yourself higher as opposed to lowering the lathe? It might be cheaper. I, I would have to use about a six inch platform. <laughs> Oh, just, just pile <laughs> some cement blocks up and uh, throw, throw <laughs> Patio straps zone. through it. Yeah, there you go. You guys that are uh, maybe uh, a bit more involved in the a larger public, when you, when guys come to classes for teach, for lays, or how many of them, sorry, how many guys have come to you and say, well, I need a lathe now that you've taught me how to use one? Is that a big proportion or you tend to have Mostly people have already got a lathe when they come to a turning class. Open comment. I see. Them. No. Yeah. Is that, is that a. No, I'm not getting a response on that one. So Roy. Roy, go ahead. Yeah, we. Um, if you recall, when we were at Stevens, there was one of the students there that had a, a senior uh, project to do and it required uh, a lathe. And so I taught him to, how to use the lathe. He graduated and went on and bought a Nova. Um, and, but that, that worked out very well for him. He's, um, you know, he, wherever he is, he's just enjoying himself very much. Um, got to be at his wedding and everything is going well for him. But, um, but that was a good way for him to, to learn to turn and take it from there. But um, I have it, mine is, is a, a Jet 1642 um, and it's a two horse. Uh, we just have a new couple who've moved into Garden Spot and um, he has a 1642 with a one and a half horse. Um, so now we have two lathes and instead of just a few people arguing as to who's going to use the lathe. Now we have a lot more two people <laughs> arguing about who's going to use the lathe at the time. But it's, but that's the story. And way back when, I should tell you the uh, quickie story is I had a 60s vintage Delta lathe um, and I loved it. It was very good. It had no problems whatsoever. It was belt driven, um, but I really um, enjoyed it tremendously. But then I wanted to have something that would be variable speed. And that's when I uh, was able to uh, sell the, uh, that lathe and, and move it into my jet. Thanks. Bill Blasick, go ahead. I, uh, none of my students that I've had have had lathes. I have uh, eight lathes myself, so they have a good idea as to what's available out there. And Almost every student has bought a lathe after getting lessons. So, so is there one that you actually prefer to, when your students ask you for a recommendation? Uh, my or only thing that I tell them is I like cast iron. Okay. <laughs> well, that's a, that's a good way of looking at it. I was, you're talking about that. Uh, and this comes, uh, and in fact, Mike Darlow made a comment last week about um, having something so that you're, when you're turning a bowl, you're turning it on the outboard side or something along that line, so you've got outboard access. But the Nova that I used to have, instead of having outboard access, the actual head turns, I believe, on those. Um, my question about that Nova was that when you, at least when I was having it, is that it didn't always necessarily want to come back to straight center. So I was a little bit concerned about turning it back and forth on the head of it. Is there any other lathes that do that twist like the Nova does? Any other uh, model? My, my jet that I'm getting rid of uh, has a pivotable head. And when you bring it back to zero, you do have to uh, put uh, centers in each in the head and tail stock and line it up again because it has about a, a half a degree of uh, play. That's but also it, true. It is index positions every 30 degrees and 45 degrees, but they uh, at each of those positions, you can tighten it down about a half a degree out of what it right. 
really is nominally. It, the new one I'm getting does not have a rotatable head. It, it's one of the three ways that you can uh, increase the swing of a lathe to turn bowls. And it's my least favorite option personally, because generally it's put on lathes that don't have enough beef in them in the first place to be turning that large. And you're dependent on putting your banjo or tool base quite a far out to accommodate the scheme. And uh, I don't know, and it's, it, it, and the alignment thing is a pain. Although Nova's actually does have some pins that makes it line up pretty reliably on all the later. Uh, Alan here, uh, on my Harbor Freight, uh, the headstock does rotate. Uh, I don't know that I've ever used it in a rotate. Um, what a couple times I have used it. Uh, the comments about you, you do have to re realign it when you bring it back around are, are very true. And uh, Ernie Wright, uh, uh, Harbor Freight is not one of the heavier leads. So, oh, what's the biggest piece you can turn on yours, uh, um, Alan? Well, it's a uh, 1236. So over the bed, I could, and you know, till you rough it out, I, I think the biggest I've been managed so far is about 11 inches. Uh, that's still reasonable. And what's the minimum speed it goes? Well, it I put I put on the uh, I modified it using the treadmill motor, and so I've got the variable speed with it, and I can get it down with that uh, probably about a hundred. I don't know that I can go much lower than that. Well, sorry, somebody else was that somebody else waved their hand. I didn't see that. Jim Bowman, go ahead. Well, you know, it's kind of like talking about how big stuff is makes me a little embarrassed. I have a Comet Nova, the new one, uh, the 14 inch swing. I think they call it the DR14 or something like it. It's a digital readout. I had a Comet 2 before, which was only 12. The 14 gave me some uh, distance without giving me a huge price increase. I feel a big limitation at that 14 because yes, it's small. And and even if I rig something outboard, it doesn't have enough oomph to it to uh, turn. And I think Ernie was talking about that, but um, I don't know. I'd, I'd love to hear w what's the best choice in a 16 or an 18 without getting out outrageous on the price. I have no, I have no difficulty with the Novas. I have had good experiences with them. Yeah, Gerald. I have a, uh, a Grizzly 22-inch, and I've been very pleased with it. It's not the quality of the name brands, uh, but I'm very frugal. Uh, when I purchased this one, Grizzly was closing their plant up in Pennsylvania, or their facility up there, and they had a 20% discount. So I think I ended up with this 22 inch, it's 22, I believe, or something like that. And uh, I ended up for 1200 bucks. So wow. I have a, a, a decent leg. But downside, they use the same legs on practically all of their lays. Therefore, being vertically impaired, I have to have a platform to stand on to uh, use the leg most of the time. Does when you say tw 22 inch, what do you mean by that? Is that a inch swing? Okay. Is that a Reeves drive too, isn't it? For a variable well, speed? It's, it's an electronic a three phase uh, converted to, so I can use it on a single phase, 220. And it does have a, a two speeds plus the variable. What horse? Pardon me? There's what three. Horse? Horse? Yeah, Bill. Uh, what I tell my students about the Grizzly Lays is, is they're adequate, but be prepared to be the person that has to fix it. Because might... they don't supply anybody to do anything for them once you have a problem. You've got to, you know, do all this or, uh, squaring away of the lathe by yourself. I, I think that's true. I have the same lathe. It's a G07. 
uh, 42 and it's a, it's a 22 swing by 42 long. And I, I got it because it was reasonably priced and it had a lot of the features of the larger lays without the price tag. Uh, Bill, you're absolutely right. Uh, I had a problem with it initially, but Grizzly, um, rather than send me the part, they said, take the head off and send it back to us. We'll pay ship in both ways. And they fix it. Um, other than that, you got to do it yourself. Um, it, it's certainly not the, the quality of a Powermatic or a one-way, but I'll tell you what, I do some pretty large stuff on it. It goes down to 50 RP. I'm listening to the features you guys are talking about that you like. I think it has all the features of the big lays with the exception of the switch is not portable. You can't move it around. Uh, however, since you've been talking about that, I'm going to go take mine apart and see if I can make my own. <laughs> but if you're looking for a larger lathe, heavy lathe, reasonable quality lathe at a, at a really good price, I, I've had two Grizzlies. Uh, the first one I bought only went down to 600 RPM, which is why I got rid of it. I wanted one, then this one goes down to 50, at least mine does. And, you know, that's, you, you guys talked about that feature. That's a, that's a very nice feature when you're turning rather large blanks to start with. I always start at zero. It also has a safety feature. You can't start the lathe once you turn it off without going back to zero, which is, I think is a good safety feature. Yeah. One thing I might mention on uh, price point on lathes is good deal of our machinery is made in either China or Taiwan these days. And they're often made for different companies in the same plant and it's what color they painted them that day. And the companies will bargain for lower prices and they just start taking features out or the quality of components out. So there is a difference. I mean, we're all saying that you can see a difference between a Harbor Freight lathe and a, a Powermatic. But another thing that Powermatic or Jet gives you is that there will be 20 years of parts ahead uh, if something breaks. To most of us, this doesn't matter. We're not turning enough that we're going to be wearing parts out very readily. But in industry, it makes a big difference. And some, some people who take turning up from as a hobby really put a lot of miles on the lathe. So it's something to think about. Well, I have to comment on that. I've been buying Grizzly products since 1984. And I, I don't promote Grizzly. I just buy them because they're reasonably priced. Um, my first product was uh, a belt sander. Uh, a few years ago, at 27 years old, the bearing went. And you call Grizzly, and they got the part. And they're cheap. Uh, Grizzly, Grizzly, one of their uh, things they advertise is, we, we, they maintain parts for every machine they've ever sold. And so far that's been true. Er, Ernie, the other thing about the newer lathes is they're electronically driven. I think we're gonna see failures quicker or sooner than the 10 or 20 years because of the electronics. That's just the way it is. Uh, that's the, becomes the weakest point, not a bearing or not a shaft or whatever. <laughs> I think that's true. And the most important thing that you've touched on earlier, I never leave my lathe plugged in because it's a, it's 220 volts, three phase, which means there's an electronic converter in there. I never, ever leave it plugged in when it's not in use. You don't want any, any spurious signals coming over the line frying that stuff. Yeah. Uh, why don't the lathe manufacturers put off switches on them? My uh, same thing with my uh, Comet 14 is it's on all the time while it's plugged in. I mean, the electronics are. And so I'm going to go out to my shop and put a flip switch right where I plug it in. I'll just turn it off there instead of unplug it. Yeah, that's the way I wired mine up. And I think the newer, some of the new models are, I don't remember which one I saw it on. They do have a switch on there for the, for the drive power. Can I just make a comment to guys about made in China? Uh, I spent a, some of my career working back and forth in China um, with um, Reynolds Metals when I was there 10 years ago now. But my finding about made in China was that the Chinese were ready to deliver whatever we wanted. If we wanted cheap, they would deliver cheap. If we wanted good quality, they would deliver good quality. So uh, from my perspective, made in China is not where it's made. It's who made the specification for it. Yeah. So, I, I agree with you. I've dealt with China in the past. 
in, in my work. And um, the only thing I don't like about, I don't, I don't like buying grizzly parts made in China, although my lathe was. Um, the problem with the Chinese manufacturing is they'll they'll make the spec you want, but if their if their factory goes out of spec, they don't stop. They keep building them, so you could really got to watch them. Yeah. What, the, what? When I worked in video and audio, we uh, we saw a bunch of our high end manufacturers go to China, but we quickly discovered that it was the how much control that company has inserted or in, insisted on by the Chinese company. And I had no problems with our high-end audio coming out of China because the company sat on them. As a matter of fact, there were companies who made it their job to manage Chinese production. As we all know, though, at this point in time, they made another factory down the road and they copied whatever you showed them. Yeah, sure. In uh, all, sometime in the 1980s, yeah, in 1980s, uh, uh, Delta sued every American manufacturer that was selling Chinese copies, mostly Taiwanese copies in those days, of uh, Delta products. And they showed the little shaper table from a Delta shaper where they had made the patterns by taking the table and, and taking the shot off the of uh, an actual part. Shrinkage of cast iron is an eighth inch per foot. So the table is now about a quarter inch smaller. And uh, then the guy in that factory takes one of the machines home, starts his own factory. And they showed tables laying on tables that were just like step downs. It was hilarious. Yeah. <laughs> How are we going on? Um, it's Kai. Um, yes, Kai. I've I've got a an old um, lathe that I would like to um, show to Mike Dalo, if that's okay. Sure, go ahead, share a photo. Yeah, so I just share the the photo. Um, it's a Geiger lathe made in Germany. I think it's a 60s um, design. I don't know when it was made exactly. And I remember Mike talking about having had or still having a Geiger lathe. Is that right? Uh, yes, I've got a Geiger lathe, but mine's 1939 okay. with an elliptical chuck. Mm -hmm. But... Um, I, I see Geiger's gone out of business now. I was uh, looking to buy one a while ago because um, I think they're probably the best laid made. Um, mm -hmm. But if I can come back, I've sent Ernie a couple of shots. I don't know if he could put those up. Yes, I can. Oh, we'll yeah. just finish with just... Kai. Just, just one more little thing. Um, I bought this um, one second hand or maybe third hand. I don't know. It had several previous owners and then I restored it and um, made some changes to it. And if there is interest, I could put together a little PowerPoint presentation about what to watch out for if you buy a second hand lathe and what work you might be um, need to be prepared to, to do on the lathe till you get it working. Um, if that is interesting, I could could prepare something for next week or another meeting. Um, would, what do you think? think well, um, let me end your share. Hi, it looks like you have a sliding stop switch. Is that right or is that magnetic? Um, that's magnetic. Um, actually, um, there is a copying attachment to this lace as well, which I removed and that copying attachment runs along this metal bar here that has got teeth um, down here. And I just use it for attaching my um, speed control, yeah. Hmm. And it's magnetic, so I can move it. Mike, you're gonna, sorry, I, we're getting close to the end of our hour. I'm not gonna stop the video because of an hour. I wanna let everybody know that it's 10.57, so technically we're over in three minutes, but this conversation can go on as long as you want for anybody who wants to. So Mike, go ahead with, you said you sent some pictures to Ernie? Yes, just two. If Ernie could put them up, I'll talk to them. That's not one of mine. Here we are. Right. Okay. 
Um, a couple of particular features which um, irritate me. One is tool rests. I use the tied underhand grip, which has the forefinger running underneath the tool rest. And so the, um, the rests to the left and the right are really not much good. You see there I've put on the steepest angle that you can hold the tool at. And uh, 38 on the left and the middle's 30. And the right one is the new Vicmark tool rest, which is 57 degrees. Now there's another shot. Can you put the next one on, Ernie? Here. The right hand shot shows me doing what we call a faceplate turning. So they generally disc like turnings. And for these, you need the tool at a very steep angle. And so if you don't have a suitable tool rest, then you can't get the tool at the proper angle. And pretty well every lathe has a great gobby cast iron tool rest and they're not worth a crumpet in my view. You want a tool rest design which will allow you to use the detail gauge very steeply. The shot on the left there is one of my lays and it's a small Vic mark and you can see the outboard system which I've got rigged up. So there's a steel plate um, with a banjo on it. Now the important thing as I said last week if, if you imagine you want to hollow a bowl say you're right-handed the natural way to do it is to move the nose of the tool from right to left across the front of your body. And the only way you can do that is on an outboard system or an equivalent. If you're going to do that, then the lathe in this case is running forwards. But the best way to turn the outside is to have the lathe running backwards. And then you can use the same sort of approach. But in order to run the lathe backwards safely, you've got to have a system whereby you can lock the chuck onto the spindle nose. So in my view, if you want to enjoy bowl turning, then you need an outboard or an equivalent. You've got to have a tool rest which is absolutely rigid because if there's any flex in it, then <coughs> that's going to be, um, you, it's, that's going to cause ripples in the wood. And the problem with the rotating headstock is that you tend to have rather flexible tool rest systems. So that's my thought that if you want to turn bowls, have an outboard and you've got to have a, a spindle chuck lock on it and then you want a tool rest where you can um and the, the the photograph on the right i'm turning inboard but i've got a, a tool rest section it's that middle section from the previous photograph so that i can get the tool steeply if you look at a lot of tool rest you'll see that paint's rubbed off on the bottom edge because in attempting to get the tool steep they've had to run it along the bottom edge instead of the top edge. So that's about all I've got to say, thank you. Okay, thank you. One advantage on the Powermatic that I have is that the, you can slide the headstock down to the end and you can spend the end of the ways to do an inside of a bowl or a hollow form. Pretty much do the out, like you're doing an outboard on what he's showing in the picture there. Ernie, can you end your share screen? Thanks. Mike, I Thanks. believe you said you had uh, Oliver lathes. Uh, I used to have two Oliver pattern makers lathes end to end, mm -hmm. so I could turn 20 feet long. And um, it was about a, uh, three feet, no more than that, probably about four feet swing. 
Yeah, I think I saw one of those down in Baltimore. We went down to, I think it was Mark Soleil shop down there and he had a, a big giant uh, 40 some inch swing and he had a he had about a 38 inch piece chucked on there and he actually let us turn a little bit on it. Uh, yeah. it was a, well, it, it we was, used to do a lot of patterns, particularly for the precast concrete trade. So uh, a lot of classical column shafts. Yeah, he, he had one with about a 20 inch or 20 foot bed on it and he had this big bowl laid. Mm. Well, there was a chap in Sydney who had a, I think it was about uh, 40 feet between centers um, with a wooden bed and using the components very much like the old um, Conno Malave. Well, and he used to turn all the flagpoles and then aluminium flagpoles came in and put him out of business. Yeah, there was a shop here that bought a wooden lathe and I, I saw it the one day I was in the shop there it had about a, I don't know, about 18 or 20 foot bed on it. And they pulled it apart and they found shims underneath it. There were 1864 newspapers to shim the thing up. So it was pretty old. Well, John, uh, Ron, Ron, if you want to, you can go down to Blue Ball Machine and they've got a nice 20 or 30 foot lathe upstairs so you can Yeah, that's go what along. I'm talking about. Oh yeah, is it? Okay. Yeah. Well, it's for sale. You could go buy it if you need it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So, wow, well, gentlemen, have thank to, you. You'd have to put it out in the yard there at the retirement home. There you go. Hey, what Anybody happened to the specifically? Well, sorry about the noise. So, whatever happened to the lays that were called bowl lays? Doug, you had found one years ago at a estate sale, but it was gone before we got it. Whatever well, that's, happened to this. That's sort of what the stubby is that my, that um, Ray Simmons had. There, there are some around that are called bolets still that you can buy. The original of that was the Union Graduate, which that was the picture I had with Mike's. Yeah. And mm. uh, they, there is a, a fellow in England now rebuilding them and he puts a VF uh, D on them. Uh, and, and brings them all up to modern standards and he gets unbelievable price. The one I was showing, if you want to put me back to screen share, I'll bring it up. But it, uh, it, 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 it this one was going from England to South Africa. Uh, let me get this here. Ray, how long's the bed on your stubby? Ernie, if you can increase the picture size once you get it displayed, we could see it better probably once you share. Actually, the one I have is high resolution, so it, it's okay. pretty nice. And you can see it's in the crate. The guy actually took two sides off to send me this shot for the lathe book, uh, third edition. And uh, originally it was just sheave drive, but he's got a VFD on this and uh, you can see that you can just stand right in front of your bowl. You can get your tools at any angle you want. It's got sort of a uh, an afterthought tailstock if you really feel you need that for some reason. And by the time you move that all the way out here, it would give you a fair distance between centers. Um, thanks. Kai. What for? What, do you have any idea what it was worth? I think it went for four or five grand. Wow. Not as big as I thought. Are there, uh, uh, Kai, just out of curiosity, thanks, Ernie. Um, Kai, are there any German lathe makers left or are they all gone now? Um, most of them, they, they are gone. Um, I know of, of one who, um, still manufactures lathe in, in Germany. Um, it's um, a company in Erzgebirge and they, for example, also built the VB36. I don't know whether you know that one. It's a, a British lathe. It's also a bowl turning lathe. And if you're interested, I can have a look for a photo and show you. Yeah, that business is Steinert. Yeah, that's right. <laughs>
and and they seem to acquire some other German companies um, that used to build lace and they now um, manufacture their lace or distribute them. So um, it, there are not so many left in, in Germany, that's right. And even with the Geiger, there is someone who still produces spare parts for the Geiger lace, he used to work for Geiger um, before they went bankrupt and he keeps on selling spare parts and repairing machines and stuff like this. Um, yeah, but Geiger doesn't exist anymore. They build really huge pattern making, making lathe um, as well. I, th I think that um, Mike Darrell brought up a very interesting point, which is I don't, I know that the, the uh, tool rests that come with the, um, with the um, lathe I have is just a, p a piece of junk as far as I'm concerned. So first thing you do is invest right off the bat, go out and find yourself a decent tool rest. Oh, okay. Well, gentlemen. Indeed. Yeah, Ernie, go ahead. I'm See just you later. Saying who's bye bye. Bye bye. Say bye bye. It's been another <laughs> hour, perfectly good hour wasted. Mike, thank you for joining us from Australia. Again, Kai, welcome. Thanks for joining us from, uh, um, from uh, Germany, and we will hope to see you next week. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. Bye. See you next week. Yeah, bye. Bye. Come on, guys. Bye. So long.